met you uh, a little over a year ago at the Freedom Force International Conference by Gia Edward Griffin in Phoenix, Arizona, and you told me a lot of fascinating things, and you, you gave a very interesting and in-depth in lecture at that event, and you're carrying a lot of your activism and journalism forward. Um, here at this AMS conference, what is your basic purpose? Well, I want to interview scientists and get basically their feedback on some pretty pertinent questions that the public wants to ask. So um, I did a GoFundMe to get here, uh, so I think a lot of people paid a lot of money for me to come here and get these questions asked. So we're going to be talking about weather warfare and how weather warfare is a thing. It was banned in 1978, and there's really no way to catch anybody doing it today. And it still continues. Yeah, well, that's, that's the big thing. Do we know? Do we know if it continues? Do we know if this is even a problem? Well, the CIA called Alan Robach. He's a geoengineer who's going to present tomorrow. And when the CIA called him in March of 2015, they said, if Russia was messing with our weather, would we know it? And his answer was, probably. I find that unacceptable. So, because this is a national security concern, the CIA wouldn't be calling geoengineers out of the blue about this in the forest. It wasn't. Yeah. The, obviously, the, you know, the, the media, the, the, the powers that be, whoever, that constantly say, you're a conspiracy, tinfoil, hatter, because you believe these things, when they cannot prove otherwise. So, who's the conspiracy theorist? I believe that it's probably the so the, 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 the situation requires somebody to do something. And because nobody's doing anything but talking about it, I decided I would do something about it. So we came up with the Environmental Modification Accountability Act, and it's a way to make NMOD, the weather warfare ban, work and useful. So the general idea is that we create a 48-hour notification window you must notify a worldwide registry that you're going to modify the weather 48 hours before you do it. If you do not, we will consider you to be hostile. The NMOD law basically says no hostile weather modification. But the only way to tell if a person's intent is hostile is to make them tell what their intent is beforehand. And if you don't tell me what your intent is, then clearly you're up to something. We're going to look into it. So how do we look into it? Um, Ronald Reagan would have said, trust but verify. So I, try, I thought long and hard about that, and the only way to verify this is with sensors. So we're here to build a sensor network, put it in your backyard, so you can test your own rain. You can watch your sky, and other people can too. So I created a map at climateviewer.org, and um, it's called Climate Viewer 3D. And the general idea is that with ClimateViewer.org and ClimateViewer 3D, you can have, you know display everybody's sensor in your backyard at the same time, collect it all in a database, and share it with scientists. They'll benefit from it as well. But you can sleep well at night knowing that there were no weather modification chemicals coming down in your backyard, that you didn't sense any electromagnetic radiation last night that shouldn't have been there, and that your local climate is performing like normal. So this is a serious problem that most people are concerned about chemtrails. They're concerned about weather modification in general. And I'm hoping that since there's a law in the books that makes weather work for illegal, why don't we start there and make that law work instead of trying to write new laws? Yeah, 2017, of course, was a very bumpy year. We had hurricanes, Harvey, Irma, and Maria. We've seen some very... Um, incredibly extensive fires in California that defy easy explanations or at least defy conventional explanations. 2017 seemed to give a lot of indication that we could certainly allege quite strongly that the weather's being tampered with to whatever degree and that it is causing very tangible physical harm, property, loss of life, and whatnot. Where does nature leave off and where does mankind's tampering take over? 2017 certainly was a banner year for asking these questions. And uh, certainly this leads to the obvious question is how much of this might be a result of weather modification that would fall in the warfare category? How much of it might be exactly. so-called more innocent modification that maybe went awry or the results were more catastrophic than the experimenters thought it would be? Because as we're learning at this conference, there's experiments that go on that might not qualify as warfare. 
but but they might not always know what the consequences are. What about even non-warfare that might have inadvertent that's, consequences? That's a great point. So that's why that's why I was trying to map this stuff out on Quantum Viewer 3D. And what you'll see is these are the NOAA reports for weather modification in America, 2004 to 2012. All along the Rocky Mountains are cloud seeding generators. They are on the ground. The thing that scares me about commercial, legitimate, legal weather modification is the scale. So when you have so many cloud seeding generators operating simultaneously on the West Coast, when we're seeing basketball size hail on the East Coast, and torrential floods, and, and you know big snow blizzards, and all of the West Coast are modifying the weather, what are the downwind effects of that? Has anybody ever really looked into it? I don't think so. But all we ever hear about is climate change, not the climate changers. And that's exactly what I was going after in a current and, and or future stories I'm posting at AmericanFreePress.net are asking that same question. What about the climate changers? Because it seems like we're given a false dichotomy. Climate change is either we have the routine industrial and agricultural emissions causing a general catastrophic trend in global warming, or people say, well, that's just a hoax. They don't ask that. They don't ask the question that there the could be climate changes, the in-between, the third alternative where, yes, mankind is changing the climate, but it's not our routine emissions. It's more targeted, deliberate emissions experimentation, right. weather warfare, right. some of it unintended consequences, some of it might be intended consequences. But this is being left completely out of this binary climate change exactly. debate. Exactly. So, so we have it at weathermodificationhistory.com. We have a 200 year history of weather modification documented, government websites, university websites, the best credible references on the planet I could find. Um, 146 entries in the timeline that will blow anybody's mind. And I say, our slogan there is, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. And that's where we're at. We're in a situation where the majority of the attendees that I have talked to here so far generally don't know that weather modification is even a thing. Certainly don't believe weather warfare is a thing. And don't see the, the need for this. The hope is that we can open their eyes a little, show them the need for this, put some impetus behind it so that we can go to the State Department make this all reality. Um, I've already got the support of David Keith and uh, Dr. Renaud Richter, um, two chief comment geoengineering scientists, and I hope to get more because when I go to the State Department, I'm going to need all the help I can get. I know the public supports me on this, I've got to go for me to prove it. What we need is the scientific community to, to, to really get behind us on this so that when we go to log, lobby our State Department to make it a reality, that they see the need. And they don't go put your tinfoil hat on and get out of my office. Which countries are primarily thought to be involved in weather and warfare uh, or heavy, heavy, heavy experimentation, modification, and so on and so forth? So that would be obviously America, Russia, and China. Now, Russia has a long history of, um, in fact, Russia is a, an expert on ionospheric heating. They were doing it before America. So they have a longer track record of messing with that. The Sura facility, the Russian Duga-3 radar, it was connected to the church. Going back to the Soviet days? Yes, yes. The, the Duga-3 radar was known as the woodpecker or steel yard. It was a ionosphere heater that was connected to the Chernobyl reactor. Um, in 80, the December of 83, we had uh, record-breaking cold all over America and an El Nino that was screwed with by electromagnetic radiation. U.S. government blames that on the Duga-3 woodpecker. Ironically, the Chernobyl reactor that powered it blew up three years later. So the question remains is, did we blow up the nuclear reactor at Chernobyl to keep it to stop weather warfare over America? And guess what? The, the Soviets had to do cloud seeding to get the, the radiation out of the rain coming from Chernobyl. So it's a weather modification circle going crazy. But regardless, when you're talking about ionosphere heating and the woodpecker and these things, even the scientists here will pretend that it's not a thing. What if you present to these scientists, the scientists or to viewers of this, the general American populace, the idea that Operation Popeye is declassified, it was real, it was used in Vietnam to, to make torrential rain on the Ho Chi Minh Trail to stop supply lines and troop movements from the North during the Vietnam War. 
I mean, hard documents. What about that and many other documents you showed at the Arizona program? If you present it to the people at this meteorological site, what do they say? Well, so far, most of them, especially like the, the contractors in there that are selling stuff, they just want to get away from this. Oh, I really don't want to talk about it. I imagine that I'll be able to get a couple of scientists to sit down and talk and we'll have a discussion about it. And really, there's no way out of this. You know, like I have all the evidence printed out right here in the end in case of need. So, the honest thing is that we just want to have a discussion. You know, the public wants this to be talked about. So, I'm here to try to get that discussion started. And I think that we will do that. Um, we have, we have a, a, a large community online who are sending death threats to climate scientists. And that's unacceptable as well. So, what I'm trying to do here is come up with a solution that both parties can agree to. And, and I think it starts with transparency. I noticed the footnote as we wind up this interview uh, on one of the uh, lectures earlier today here on January 9th that there's planned and in in inadvertent weather modification is right in the language of the American Meteorological Society. So they do concede there's cloud seeding, they do say there's planned and inadvertent weather modification. In their vernacular, what does that mean? Are they acknowledging at least a little bit of what you're saying? No, planned is... Uh water resource management boards all over America paying for cloud seeding. So a good example, Sacramento Municipal Utility District paid $900,000 for cloud seeding over the Oroville Dam. That is planned. They put out a bid. They said, hey, we'll do it. We'll pay $900,000. So that's planned weather modification. What is the purpose of that kind of localized cloud seeding? What do they hope to accomplish? Well, in, in the majority of the cases, they are, they're reservoirs that are empty. So the people paying for the weather modification are usually the water resource boards. So in, in Sacramento, it's the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, it's mud. And uh, there's a, uh, all over Texas, there's many different water reservoir districts that run these, that pay for this sort of stuff. And basically, it goes like this. The West Coast is strapped for water. And whenever uh, the water starts running low, they're going to pay somebody to try to fill it up. And it's that simple. The water strap states are not going to give up this technology. They plan it and pay for it. They have for 60 years. Inadvertent is chem tracks. They call that inadvertent. Ship tracks. Those are inadvertent. Meaning they are pollution-based modifications of the sky. Nobody meant to do it. So that's really the rub. The rub is that everybody online is mad about seeing the sky over their house being, you know, the weather over their home being changed on a daily basis. But the government says, well, that's all an accident. How much longer are you going to accidentally do this? But what we've really come to realize is it's no longer an accident because they're actually talking about using dope jet fuel to geoengineer the planet. And it's a way to cool the planet by putting sulfur in jet fuel. So this isn't even like a, a conspiracy any longer. This is a, you guys are just ignoring this. Um, I interviewed the head of the FAA and he said he wanted to make clouds by day, none by night. So the official FAA position is, we make clouds all day long and we'll cool the planet. We make none at night and we'll allow it to escape. To escape. Is that James Rogers? Oh my God. Um, well, so well to wind up what you're saying, there's some uh, low level admissions that what you're saying has the uh, They're worried about their professional reputations, their jobs, their, their status. They don't want to be mocked by their colleagues for going, yes, I believe chemtrails is a problem too. So I made a page, uh, climateviewer.com slash cirrus clouds matter because cirrus clouds matter. And the truth of the matter is, whenever a plane makes a contrail and it fans out and covers the sky, it's no longer a chemtrail contrail, persistent contrail, it's a cirrus cloud. The cirrus clouds trap heat, it's a problem, they know it, they want to do cirrus cloud thinning, which is a way of spraying bismuth triiodide to melt the clouds away, use lasers to zap the cirrus clouds so that they spread the ice all over the sky very thin. And, and how many ways do they have with modifying the atmosphere? You said 10 different ways, right? Yeah, well, I came, I came up with a, a infographic uh, 10 technologies to own the weather today. And the idea behind that was to try to get it down to 10 broad categories of technologies that they had. And one being like lasers. You can use lasers to make it rain or you can 
use lasers to steer the lightning bolts. But regardless, most people know about none of these. And if you ask most people that do know about weather modification, they generally only know about clouds. And climateviewer.org and climateviewer.com, correct me if I'm wrong, shows those 10 ways they do that. Shows yeah, if you go to climateviewer.com, you can see my blog. That's where the article 10 Technologies to Learn Weather Today is. Um, you can also read about the Environmental Modification Accountability Act. It's at climateviewer.com slash nmod. And then finally, if you go to weathermodificationhistory.com, you can learn all about the history of the people who are changing the world. All right, Jim Lee, good enough for now. Mark, we appreciate it. Good to see you again. Good luck to you. You too. And for, for American Free Press, I'm Mark Anderson. We'll see you in the next video.